Okay, thanks, uh, Carlo, for the very nice introduction. I hope everybody who's joining us virtually can hear me. Uh, yeah, today we're going to talk about means of mitigating jammers or even strong interferers. And maybe you were wondering what this picture is. And this, at the end of the talk, you probably will know why we picked this. This is an AI generated picture with the keyword a Sandman fighting with the red that will be in the base station. Uh, the Sandman is this here. And you will see at the end why we picked that. Yeah. Um, I don't have to motivate the topic too much, but I think everybody knows that wireless communication infrastructure is more and more critical to society in all our countries. Um, and even if you just uh, search for jammers in the news items, you can see that uh, jamming attacks and countermeasures are basically everywhere. I don't want to go into too many of the politics, but there's also jamming also plays a role in popular culture. For example, if you've seen the latest Top Gun movie, they couldn't use the F-35 plane because there was GPS jamming. Of course, it's very questionable whether that's a real thing, but the yeah, jamming is basically everywhere. So let me just dive right into uh, the technical aspects. Um, Especially, let me first talk about the model, and then we go talk about uh, what we can do against jammers. And in this talk, we are uh, concerned with multi-antenna base stations, so we look at massive multi-antenna base stations. I hope, oh yeah, you can see my cursor. Um, we have massive multi-antenna base stations with B antennas, and we have uh, U user equipments that communicate simultaneously to this base station, and we're considered at the uplink in this case, so the users can transmit their information to the base station. The model uh, we use is uh, just for simplicity, it can be more complicated, but uh, everything we're doing in this talk can be illustrated with this model here. Uh, we assume that the base station receives a vector of B dimensions because we have B antennas. And then we have the channel matrix, which is the characterizes the channel between all the user equipments and the base station. It's a B times U matrix. And as I said, we assume more base station antenna than users. Then uh, we have the user transmit symbol vectors here with the entries picked from a constellation. Then we also have our jammer here or a strong interferer, which is basically characterized by uh, the channel vector J. So we assume a single antenna jammer here and the symbol they're sending. We have no idea what it is and how strong it is. And we have noise of course in the system. And as you will see later, so uh, we basically try to get rid of uh, this component here but we're also going to be look at the little bit more general case where the jammer may have more than one antenna. And of course, uh, the jammer uh, also has like multiple ways of, of transmitting in this case here. Yeah. So this is the basic model that we're looking at for this talk. Now, multi-antenna jammer mitigation, if you just think of it on a higher level, is actually not that difficult. There are papers that are probably four or five years old. Um, there are basically two ways of getting rid of a jammer. So what we wanna do is we wanna let the users go through and we want to kind of block the signal from the jammer. The probably one of the most simplest and most intuitive approaches is just to project on the orthogonal subspace or short POS. And the trick is if you know the jammer channel, what you can do is you can uh, compute this projection matrix, which projects on the orthogonal complement of the jammer's channel J. If you multiply this to your received vector, then magically the jammer disappears. C basically modifies your channel matrix and modifies the noise, but basically now you have a jammer free channel and you can do your linear estimation of the data symbols just based on this jammer free system. This is a very simple approach. There's another approach and it's basically kind of like the linear mean squared error estimate approach where you say, if you know the power of the jammer symbol, we can just add the jammer channel as one additional column to the channel matrix and do linear minimum mean squared estimation, which is called robust linear minimum mean squared error estimation, and just directly get the estimate of uh, the users. And as I said, we need a little bit more knowledge, uh, but these methods, the POS and RLMMSC are basically the same, especially if the jammer gets uh, stronger, then these two things will coincide. So and this is a way of basically getting rid of jammers completely. Um, if you look at the performance, again, this is a very simple result. This way of uh, getting rid of uh, jammers with multi-antenna base station is extremely effective. If you look uh, at this curve between S and R and uncoded bit error rate, um, we have no jammer and it's actually hidden behind these curves here, the no jammer performance here. This is a base station with 256 antennas and 32 users at the same time. If you don't do anything against the jammer, and here we assume the jammer is 30 dB stronger than the user power, then you get an error floor, and of course, that will be devastating for communication. 
But if you use either POS or this robust LMMC, you can see basically recover the channel free performance. And also you can see there's no real difference between these two methods in this scenario here. So yeah, we know two ways of almost perfectly getting rid of jammers. And yeah, so you may ask yourself now, look, why am I not stopping this presentation here and we're all gone and go home uh, or already home? So yes, so you can imagine things are usually not that simple. Uh, they appear that simple, they're usually not. For example, how would we do uh, medium access control on the jamming? Very good question. How do we synchronize the system on the jamming? Very good question, but fortunately I'm not going to look into this. So um, these are very difficult tasks uh, and I'm going to assume uh, there's a way of doing this. And of course we are looking into this as well, but just assume these two things, even though they're extremely interesting and challenging, um, we are uh, assume that they're just going to work. But what we're going to look at today is what can we do? Uh, what, what are the important aspects if we consider hardware constraints? Like what do jammers do if you have actually like an RF chain uh, that uh, gets uh, uh, attacked by a jammer, for example. And then also, how do we actually learn the channel of the jammer? And you will see both of, both of these things are non-trivial and require quite uh, interesting solutions. And you can see here, for example, learning the channel of the jammer is extremely important in both of the methods I was showing before. So this talk is split in two parts. The first part, we're going to look at what happens if you have a jammer and you have finite resolution analog to digital converter, say of 10 or even lower resolution ADCs. So what can you do in this case if you have a strong jam? And the second part is how do we deal with estimating the jammer channel? How can we do that? And it turns out that if the jammer is smart, this is not trivial. Yeah, so these are basically the two things we're gonna look at and let me just start right with the first approach. So uh, the first topic, uh, basically it's about what if we have uh, low resolution analog to digital converters at the base station and maybe I should motivate why this would be interesting. So if we have hundreds of antennas and each antenna is supposed to be a pair of ABCs and DACs for in-phase and quadrature, um, then um, we have basically access to all antenna signals, which allows us maximum flexibility in terms of beam forming, null forming, channel estimation, synchronization, all these things are easier if it's all digital and also it's uh, less expensive if uh, we, for example, try to migrate because we have a minimum amount of um, circuit uh, analog circuit uh, components. Of course, there still would be some, but if you build, for example, a hybrid uh, array, then it's uh, way more complicated than hybrid technology. So it would be desirable to use uh, ADCs, separate ADCs for every antenna, but uh, of course, uh, there's also other issues, but maybe another thing is if we start reducing the resolution, we can also deal with interconnect system costs and power consumption. And the reason why we would like to uh, reduce that is not just to get rid of like uh, interconnect and costs, but uh, it also reduces the power consumption and not just in the ADCs, but also we can uh, potentially also lower the quality of the uh, surrounding RF components. So basically what we would like to do is we would like to build an all digital base station, but we not necessarily want to have very high resolution for each ADCs, because if you have say 128 ADCs uh, for a 64 antenna base stations is maybe uh, extremely power consuming. So assume that we have, I don't know, say less than 10 or maybe five or six or eight bits. Uh, now the problem arises the following if you have a jammer. So what we could do, we could leave the range of the quantizer fixed, but then like fixed basically based on the user power, uh, user receive power, but then the jammer will just push our ADCs into saturation. And you can imagine uh, it's very difficult to, to do anything in this case. The other approach is to expand the quantization range to capture the jammer without clipping but then what happens is if the, if the users is significantly weaker, they will drown in the quantization. Noise. So you kind of have to decide what you want to do. And you see both of these solutions are not that great for uh, communication. And let me just show you an example why this is uh, problematic. So here, this is an example with, I think it's a four bit ADC. Uh, the jammer is 60 dB stronger again. This is again, the 256 space station antennas 32 user example. And here, what we try to do is we try to compensate or mitigate the jammer after the ADCs. And you can see here, uh, if you had no jammer, we are all fine. Uh, it's a little bit worse because of the ADCs um, that are low resolution, but um, if you don't mitigate it at all, it doesn't work at all. But now these two methods, POS and RLMMC that we've seen before, they suddenly don't work anymore. And basically it's too late to deal with the jammer because you are, they already saturated your ADC or they already caused or drowned your signal and quantization noise. 
So this does not really work. If you assume that you have finite resolution uh, data converters, um, getting rid of the jammer with projecting or uh, RLMSC after the ADCs is too late, as you can see here. So it just does not work. So let's quickly look at this idea. And I think this is also the way we keep on going. We assume that we just set that the ADCs um, so that we don't clip as much. And basically what will happen if we don't do anything special, we would drown the signals in quantization noise. And just very briefly that you know uh, how quantization works or what we, how we model it. So we assume we have a qubit quantizer with a fixed step width. We have a signal that we want to quantize. First, we have a game control. This could be an automatic game control that puts it into the range that there's not too much clipping. Then it gets quantized and we get the quantized signal. And then just for modeling purposes, we will uh, rescale this quantized signal to get basically the same uh, range of the original signal that we had the input, and then we do our signal processing based on that. And we can model that, so we take the received vector, we quantize it, and this is basically a shortcut for uh, describing all these steps, and you can see we take the real part, so first we scale down uh, the, the signal, then we take the real part, quantize it independently from the imaginary part, and then after quantization, we scale it back up. So this is the mathematical way we're modeling in this case. And this gain matrix um, does not need to have the same gains on all the diagonals. So not all antennas need the same gain. And you can see later why this may be potentially useful to do. Another thing we're going to use is we have to somehow deal with the quantization uh, effects. And of course, people typically use quantization noise model. We do something very similar. Uh, we, we basically leverage this popular tool from 1952, where you can say you can take your quantized um, signal X and you can write it as a scaled down version of X plus a distortion. And if you pick this scaling factor, according to what Huskong uh, developed a long time ago, uh, which is called Huskong gain in this case, case uh, what it does, it makes the distortion and the signal uh, uncorrelated. So it's kind of like, think about it, the first order independence between uh, the two things. And then you can also uh, calculate the distortion variance, which is given by this quantity. So basically this is a trick of making these two components um, uncorrelated. Uh, another model would be to just set this to one, but then there will be potentially some correlation between these, uh, between the input of the quantizer and the distortion that you get. So what we do now with this model, we take this and what I've shown on the previous slide, we take our received vector, we quantize it, and remember, it has all these steps, uh, it's scaling down, quantizing, and scaling back up. And now we use within here, we use this uh, idea of Huskon. So basically, we replace the quantizer with the scaled down version plus the distortion. And if you massage the term, terms a little bit here in this case, you get a scaled down version of the received vector. And you get these two distortion terms, which come from quantization. And you can see here, it's uh, multiplied with the inverse of this diagonal matrix that has the scaling factors. And this means if we scale down our input, it basically scales up the distortion in this case. And this is uh, uh, an issue here. You see that if you have to basically uh, capture a larger range because the channel is very strong, this means that after all these quantization steps, we basically see a much larger distortion on the signal of interest. Um, and clearly, and I already mentioned it before, there's only one way we can deal with this. Basically, we have to do something before uh, we convert the signal to the digital domain. So in order to deal with jammers or interferes, we have to somehow make sure that we, if we basically we should get rid of it before uh, quantization possible. Um, and what, we're gonna, what I'm going to talk about are two ways. Uh, I'm not going to introduce the names if you want to see where the names come from. These are acronyms that come from the papers. I'm not going into details, but we have two methods. One method is called Hermit. And the idea is basically getting a rid of a large part of the jammer already before the ADCs in the analog domain. And the second approach is uh, SNPs. It's another acronym. And you can look at the paper if you want to know where it comes from. Um, and the idea there is uh, you basically make sure that not all of the jammer's energy is on all ADCs, but only on a subset of the ADCs. And then you do your digital processing. And let me start with the second one because it's uh, a little bit easier, I would say also easier from an implementation perspective. And we call the technique beam slicing. And so the idea is this, let's just consider uh, higher frequencies millimeter wave where we know the signals are a little bit more directional. Um, and the idea with beam slicing is we wanna focus the, the jammer's energy instead of just all ADCs equally, we wanna focus it on only a certain set of ADCs. And the idea underlying this is 
if you take, if you have a linear array, a uniform linear array, and you take a discrete Fourier transform of this, then uh, basically this does split space into multiple beams. And you can imagine if a channel comes from one direction, it will now not uh, uh, affect all uh, directions, but only the directions that are associated um, with the incoming beam of the channel. And we're doing it with a slight twist on it. So imagine we have a uniform linear array. In this case, it's just simplified here. And we take, split it into smaller clusters and small groups. And we do a analog spatial transform. So we do a Fourier transform in analog, and this can be done with passive components. For example, it's a fixed transform, it's nothing adaptive, but we do say a four point DFT in analog. Then what's coming out of this spatial transform, each output of this uh, spatial DFT is basically has a certain beam pattern. And if, for example, the user come right, uh, the user equipment uh, transmits right from the front into the array, it will basically affect mainly this beam that looks into the front of the array. And if the jammer comes from a different direction, typically then they don't come from the same direction, uh, you will see here in this case, for uh, this beam here that is totally focused on the user equipment will basically be almost nulling the jammer here in this case. But there may be some other beam directions that will be affected by the jammer. And then for the second cluster, what we do is we do a, a rotated version of the DFT. So we don't just take a conventional DFT, you can actually, uh, uh, apply a fixed phase shift to rotate the phases of the, of the uh, output of the DFT. And basically this here, you see we get slightly different beam patterns. Again, they're fixed, they're not adaptive, they're just fixed at design time. And here in this case, uh, you can see the beam patterns are slightly shifted. Actually, they're shifted in a perfect way. So there's minimum overlap between the beam patterns of this cluster and this cluster. And you can see in this case as well, that the jammer will most likely affect this beam, but there are other beams that are not as much as affected. So basically the trick is we do cluster-wise analog transforms before the ADC. And the reason why we also do clusters is because it's very difficult to build large analog transforms, but it's fairly easy to build smaller uh, spatial transforms in the analog domain. And then we also use these phase rotated uh, S-point discrete Fourier transform matrices. So not just the same Fourier transform, but slightly shifted one that you get a better uh, angular resolution. And this trick here with the with the phase rotated version gives more diversity. So we basically create more fixed beams. So here's a, an overview. So we have some RF components, then we have our uh, spatial transform. They're non-adaptive, but they're fixed. And typically these are discrete Fourier transforms with different phase rotations. And this is exactly the first trick. So basically we do beam slicing and analog, then we quantize, and then we do digital equalization. And these spatial transforms, what happens is if there's a jammer coming from a certain direction, only some of the ADCs are affected, mainly affected by the jammer, and some ADCs are less affected by it. And then we can do take care of this different amount of distortion that we see at the different ADCs and do our digital equalization. In this case. So basically, we get try to get rid of uh, the jammer in terms of focusing it only on a subset of the ADCs and not on all ADCs. And the hope is, of course, that some ADCs are uncontaminated and then allow us to get the signal back in this case. And of course here, and we're gonna talk about this a little bit later, we need some means of estimating the channel of the users and of course also of the jammer. I'm gonna talk about this uh, in the second part. But let's see how well this works. So this is a, a simulation with a millimeter wave magic model from Quadriga, uh, line of sight. Um, I think it's, uh, if I'm not mistaken, at 60 gigahertz uh, carrier frequency. We have some 256 base station antennas, uh, 32 users. We have some power control, 16 QAM. We use pretty low resolution. Um, and we use a jammer that is uh, 25 dB stronger than the average user equipment. And here you can see the top curve here. That's what would happen if you don't do any analog transform. You just take the signal that you get, you quantize it before a bit, and you try to do your uh, linear estimation. So you see you get a pretty high error floor. And now if we split the array into pairs of, uh, so we do our spatial transforms on pairs of antennas, you already get a little bit improvement, but you can see here if you make the spatial transform larger, basically, uh, because we get higher directivity, in this case, we get better performance. And maybe what you also see is if you, um, if you watch carefully, look carefully here, you can see if you take the one spatial transform, it actually gets slightly worse. And that has something to do is because now with the full spatial transform, some of these user signals are so directional that they basically only uh, get focused onto one ADC or it can be, and then the ADC resolution is not enough to capture uh, 
the signal for that. So there is some kind of an optimal um, array size, uh, so a cluster size for the analog transform, but you can see you can significantly improve performance um, by just doing these passive uh, non-adaptive analog transforms before your ADCs. Yeah. Then, so this is the non-adaptive way. There's nothing adaptive, as I said, you just make your uh, analog processing once you fix it and it does not need to change depending on the jammer. But now you can also imagine what if you have some kind of an analog circuit before ADC that can uh, be tuned to deal with the jammer by knowing something about the jammer. And this is uh, this method I mentioned was Hermit. And it's the same idea. The idea here is basically to get rid of the jammer uh, before. Uh, and the way we're doing it, we want to create a transform, a spatial transform that is multiplied to the received vector. And then we do quantization. And we are not just allowing any spatial transform. We would like to have a spatial transform that has a very specific structure. So it could be implemented efficiently in analog. And basically, if you see this spatial transform here, it looks very similar to the projection on the orthogonal uh, complement of the subspace band by the jammer. We have an identity subtracted by an outer product. But what we do here is we pick the elements of these two vectors, B and A. We select them from a discrete set because in analog, it's very difficult or impossible to do continuous multiplication. Basically, what we want is we can do multiplications in the analog domain with a discrete set. It's not too difficult to do. And what we want to do is we want to minimize this objective. So we want when multiplying this uh, matrix here to our received vector, we want to be as close as possible to the jammer free system. And you can massage this uh, expression and you get a, an equivalent optimization problem. So we would like to find the scaling factor beta. We would like to find the vector B and A, which are taken from a discrete set uh, so that it's uh, when multiplied to the uh, received vector is as close as possible to the jammer. So these two uh, objective functions are the same. Interestingly, you can um, simplify this in independent problems. So you can first find the B uh, vector separately. Basically, you try to find a vector B that is mostly aligned with the jammer channel, but uh, with some normalization. And remember, the entries here are taken from a discrete set. This is not an easy problem to solve, but it can be solved approximately. And in some cases, if all the entries of B are on a unit circle, so it's a, a PSK-like um, set. In that case, you can even solve it optimally with efficient algorithms. For the vector A, you can do a similar thing. Uh, there's another optimization problem uh, in this case. Uh, and you can see here, it's a little bit more complicated, but again, it's over a discrete uh, set. This actually should be um, um, A here, and this should also be A, so this is a bug. And then after you've calculated these two vectors, you can find what is the optimal scaling factor that you have to use in your transform. And as I mentioned before, the specific structure we picked of a transform allows us to implement something like this in hardware. It is very similar to an analog beamformer. Uh, basically, you do analog beamforming when you multiply your, uh, your received vector with A, and then you do an auto product. It's kind of like a subtraction of your, uh, of your beamformed uh, signal, and then you subtract it from the received signal. And multiplying this into your received vector uh, with good vectors B and A and the scaling factor mitigates the jammer. And just that you uh, should recall the, the, the domains of B and A here are basically from a discrete set. Even though this looks like a 16 QAM constellation, uh, this is not really the transmit constellation. This is the, the multiplication factors that we can use in this transform vector here. And also on top of that, we allow it to split it into smaller components. So we don't want necessarily to make one spatial transform over the whole array. That's actually very difficult to build because of uh, electrical signals have a finite uh, speed on, on a circuit. So you probably want to kind of like clusterize it and uh, operate on smaller ones. So basically we use for, for smaller clusters, we do this transform. So just as a summary, we have these two methods. We had um, SNPs on the left side, which is non-adaptive fixed analog spatial transforms and then goes into the ADCs. And on the other side, we had Hermit in this case here, and these are adaptive. So there's some feedback here to tune these A and B weights of these two transforms. So the important thing is non-adaptive, adaptive. adaptive uh, here, it's typically the phase rotated DFT, completely hardwired. And this is uh, one of these projection matrices, uh, but they will be controlled by uh, uh, a block that knows something about the jam. And if you look at the performance uh, comparison between these two methods, um, you can see here the gray curve is unmitigated and the black curve is if there will be no jammer present. And you can see SNPs uh, in this case goes to this green curve here. 
And you can see that uh, Hermit uh, for different sizes of the resolution of the multipliers that are needed in the analog domain, for example, 4, 16, and 64, you can see that basically you can approach very close uh, the chamberless performance. So remember, these are, this is done with, with finite resolution multiplications in the analog domain, which can be built. So there are papers that describe how to do that. Um, and you can see you can basically get very close um, to your uh, chamberless signal. And then you, it goes to the ADC and then uh, you do your signal processing. And again, as a summary, um, SNPs is non-adaptive. Um, Hermit is adaptive. And you can imagine that something that is adaptive works better, but it's also more difficult to build in practice. That's basically the result. Okay, so this was the first part. And maybe you've noticed, we've always assumed we somehow magically know the channel of the jammer. And you can also imagine maybe that is not as uh, simple as you may think. Uh, basically, we're going to show uh, first why this is not as a good assumption to assume that you just know it. And then also we show, of course, methods of, of dealing with that, of like, how can we still get this? And we basically call this concept joint chamber mitigation and, and data detection. We will see what that means later. Okay, so maybe you remember we've always assumed we somehow have an estimate or know the, the uh, channel of the jammer, this uh, vector j. So basically the idea will be as follows, what you can do in practice. You can assume, and this is a terrible assumption, that the jammer is constantly transmitting. And then you can just tell the users to not transmit. And then you can only listen to the jammer. And then you can estimate this channel. It's a very naive assumption. You can imagine this is, of course, uh, not necessarily what you would like to do, but if this is possible, if the jammer is always transmitting, you just allocate a certain phase where the users are not transmitting, you can estimate the jammer channel and then you can continue. And in this case, again, we will talk later about this assumption. Uh, you can actually do pretty well. So this is again, a, a performance result. Uh, here we have um, a curve without mitigation. These uh, orange dots here are if you estimate the channel. So you can see if you have an estimate of the jammer channel, you can get fairly close to the no jammer case. But this case here somehow assumed there was a period of 10 symbols where only the jammer was transmitted. In this case. And of course, I'm pretty sure everybody in the audience was asking like, what if the jammer is like not as stupid as shown here, but if the jammer also stops transmitting, then we try to estimate the jammer. Um, and I think the chamber doesn't need to be that smart, even it just needs to know the protocol and then uh, knows what's going on. And if you, of course, if you have a situation like that, the base station has basically no way of estimating the chamber. And then your mitigation method, for example, projecting onto the orthogonal uh, subspace here, in this case, or the orthogonal complement of the subspace here, uh, basically gives you the same performance as uh, not knowing anything. Because we basically do not know in which direct, which channel we have to null, so we basically clueless and we cannot do anything in this case. Maybe I should also say, if you had a perfect estimate, you would be here on the no jammer uh, curve in this case. Okay. Um, another thing is like, what would happen if the jammer has multiple antennas or if you have multiple jammers? Like imagine here, we have a single antenna jammer here and this jammer is transmitting when we have this idle or quiet phase. So the base station is able to estimate this jammer, but what if this, Jammer then uh, coordinates with another jammer and says, okay, and then suddenly um, let me transmit. So they switch. So of course, if that jammer transmits, we can completely let go, uh, let through our uh, mobile stations here and we can block this jammer. But then if this jammer suddenly starts transmitting because we have no clue about the channel of this one, the base station is again clueless and we, it's all lost again. And this could be either two chambers or pre one chamber with two antennas, switching antennas and these kind of things. So you can imagine that again, basically if the chamber is relatively smart here, it doesn't even need, need to be smart. It could just alternate with a fixed pattern uh, and it would be very difficult to estimate both of them. And now you can imagine, okay, maybe we need completely different ways of dealing with that because uh, smart chambers are difficult to mitigate and the ways we were looking at are not as easy. So, um, also, uh, maybe one thing that is a very important insight, it's not good enough to just try to estimate the jammer once and then use it for all the time, because exactly at the moment where you try to uh, estimate the jammer channel, um, the jammer may not be transmitting, of course. So this is, does not work. If it's smart or dynamic, it's actually very difficult. And our idea is a, a little bit different, and it's a, based on an important insight as well. Again, the idea what we call is JMD, or Joint Jammer Mitigation and Data Detection. 
And basically the idea is this, that the jammer uh, cannot leave its subspace within a coherence interval. Jammers can also not move around infinitely fast. So there will also be a coherence interval for the jammer. And now what we have to do is we have to estimate the data symbols and also the jammer channel uh, at the same time, but over multiple time slots. And I'm going to mathematically explain how this works. Um, so basically what happens is we, we identify the jammer subspace with the subspace that we observe that is least explainable by what we observe. And then we can remove it um, using algorithms. And this may sound a little like magic, but basically what we do is we solve an optimization problem of the following form. I have to introduce, uh, explain a little bit the notation. Y of D is now a matrix where each column of the matrix consists of a received vector for a different time step, um, for a different time slot. H is the channel of the users. And S of D is a matrix containing the user symbols that we try to estimate again over multiple time steps. And what we do in the optimization problem, we multiply here uh, this projection matrix. And basically what we want is we want to minimize this objective function uh, at the same time as we try to estimate the user symbols, we also try to estimate the best way of nulling any interference. And you can imagine if this um, projection matrix perfectly nulls the jammer, then this objective function can actually get very small if we also find at the same time uh, the right transmit symbols. So this is the trick in this case. So looks a little bit like magic, but basically this is how this work, works. Uh, one of the big drawbacks with any nice problem that we would like to solve, it's NP hard. Um, because we have, again, we try to detect the symbols and the symbols are typically taken from a discrete set. So uh, very difficult problem to solve, but in practice, as we all know, approximate methods are typically good enough. And the, the approximation we do here, this is not necessarily that you have to do that, it's just a way to illustrate it and it works very well. Instead of, for example, assuming QPSK symbols for our symbols of the users, we just relax it the convex hull around the QPSK constellation. So we allow all the points in here and then what we can do is we can do alternating minimization algorithm. If we fix the projection, then uh, the, the problem here is convex in S. And if we fix S, then the sub problem of learning the best projection is known by uh, taking the leading singular vectors from the left of this difference here. So it's basically the best rank one approximation but the left vectors of them. So you can see that this basically describes the algorithm that you have to do to solve this. Um, but again, if you were uh, paying attention, I was quietly assuming that we know H, right? Again, that's what kind of like what we wanted to get rid of, but I have not really discussed it, uh, uh, but yeah. So what do we do with H now? I haven't solved this problem at all. Um, again, we do not know it. And also um, just estimating H with pilots may lead to chamber contamination estimate. If the chamber transmit during the pilot phase, of course the estimate will be contaminated as well. So, but we have kind of ignored it here. Um, so yeah, there must be some magic thing we can do. There are basically two ways we can do it. Uh, there is a sophisticated way. And the most sophisticated way is we do three things at once. We detect the symbols, we find the best projection to get rid of the jammer. And we also estimate the channel at once by uh, assuming that the pilots are, uh, there's some pilot phase and there's some data phase. And we call this uh, MAD in this case stands for mitigation estimation of detection. Uh, yeah, and uh, this is how we come up with these names. But basically, this is like the ultimate goal you would like to solve. Here, we solve everything at once. We try to estimate the channel, detect the user data symbols, and also get rid of the channel at once. And then we don't have this issue of estimating H. Uh, another interesting and more efficient insight is if you use a linear channel estimate, then it turns out that uh, on your channel estimate, the contamination of the jammer is also in the same subspace as the original jammer. So meaning when you multiply from the left to the projection, this component, this error in your channel estimation matrix caused by the jammer is also gone. So basically you could just do normal channel estimation. Your channel estimate will be contaminated, but in this objective here, the projection from the left will take care of this part here because the contamination of a linear channel estimation of the jammer here is also in the same subspace. So this is basically the way where we just estimate the channel. So Sandman is the way where we estimate the channel, just plug it in. And then we only learn that we only try to identify the data symbols and the projector. And this math project here tries to solve all at once. And this one is the ultimate one. And this one is a more efficient one. And of course, we're going to compare them in a second. 
But maybe uh, very quickly explaining a little more, for example, how Sandman works. Uh, again, we just use a linear estimate and the channel estimate could be contaminated by the jammer or not, depending what the jammer was doing during the training phase. And then we do forward backward splitting or project the gradient descent. Uh, basically we do a gradient step in S and we op uh, update our projection matrix in this case. Um, the gradient descent step is fairly easy. So we know what the gradient is of this objective, assuming that P is fixed. We do one step with a step size towards this gradient. And then we project onto this relaxed constraint that we had, for example, on the units fair, uh, unit cube around the constellation. And then we do an approximate SVD. So after we have done this step, we update our P matrix. We do an approximate SVD. This could just be power iterations or something, one or two power iteration steps. And then we take the left uh, single erectors and we take I of them. I is the number of antennas of the jammer. So for example, if you have one jammer with one antenna, this would be one. But if you have two jammers with one antenna, it would be two. And then this would be our new projection matrix. So basically very simple. We do gradient descent. We project and then we update our P matrix and we repeat that. And you will see we don't even need to repeat that that many times to get good performance. This is really the summary of a Sandman of this algorithm. Uh, as you see, it's not too complicated. There's a bunch of matrix vector operations and an approximate SVD, which is really nothing but the power iterations uh, that we can do. So let's look how well this works. Um, again, the model is very similar to what we've seen. Uh, this is a little bit a smaller system. Uh, with 32 base station antennas, we have 16 users, we assume QPSK, and here the jammer uh, has 30 dB more energy than the average user equipment, but you will see we will be, we will be looking at different types of, of jammers in uh, this example here. So this is the uh, kind of like naive jammer, barish jammer, just transmitting constantly. Uh, the black curve is what, if you don't do anything, we've already seen that doesn't work at all. Uh, and then we have Sandman, which is the green curve, uh, and we have the geniated POS box. So basically what that is, is the geniated version knows the Chammer channel perfectly. And you can see that Sandman and the method that knows the Chammer perfectly, channel perfectly gets the same performance here. And then I mentioned before, MAD is where we actually do data detection, channel estimation and Chammer mitigation, uh, gets improved performance and also achieves a, a performance that is the same basically as a geniated joint estimation and detection version. And this gain here between these comes because we're also using data symbol for the green one. We're also using data symbols to improve our channel estimate. So that's where the, the gain comes from. But you can see both of these methods effectively reduce uh, a barish jammer. Again, this is kind of like a simple jammer, but what if you have a jammer that only jams during the data phase, so it's completely quiet in uh, the training phase, you can see the effect on the data is even worse if you have no idea about the jammer. But you can see again, the two methods, Sandman and MAD, are very close to their baselines that have some perfect knowledge of the Another jammer type is a jammer that only jams during the pilot phase. Uh, you can see it's kind of like similar in performance to the virus jammer. And again, the two methods get very close to the geniated methods. Uh, and you can see this, uh, this uh, joint uh, estimation, uh, joint jammer mitigation and a detection approach is very effective in reducing. Um, we have some more jammers that we can look at. So these are now four uh, single antenna barish jammers, so they're in space, separated. Um, and again, uh, we are significantly better than not doing anything and we get very close to the baseline. Uh, there's a little bit of a gap to these baselines. Uh, we run, in this case, I think it's 50 iterations. If you would run more, it gets closer and closer. So this is an artifact of basically just limiting the computational complexity, but again, very close to geniated methods. Uh, here is a four antenna jammer that dynamically switches antenna elements. Again, um, works extremely well, but again, we have some at high SNR here, we have a, a floor and again, this comes from like convergence uh, properties of the algorithm. We would have to run it for much longer to get a better estimate in this case. And then also, this is a four antenna jammer that dynamically modulates between rank one subspace. It's kind of a smooth transition between different antennas. And again, you can see we can significantly reduce it. Again, uh, this floor here comes from a finite number of iterations and also a very simple relaxation of the discrete set. There's huge room and improvement for more efficient algorithms, which we haven't really um, considered in this work. But again, the paradigm works extremely well and we can significantly improve performance, even if the jammers are extremely smart. So in addition to being able to uh, mitigate the jammers extremely well, 
JMD also has the advantage that we don't allocate a certain period just for estimating. We, there's no dedicated period for estimating the channel, jammer, and this helps in increasing achievable rates. And again, here's a result for the same uh, system. And we want to figure out what SNR will be required to achieve uh, this um, um, modulation error rate here, smaller than 17.5%. 17.5% comes from like an EVM requirement on uh, 5G and new radio. So this is just a number that if we kind of like are below that, we potentially could transmit QPSK. And what you see here is the result. So you can see here the relative achievable rate. If you have perfect knowledge of the jammer, of course, you don't need to allocate any resources to test it. And then your system can operate at 14 dB to achieve this uh, modulation error rate. Sandman gets extremely close. It's up here. We just uh, did this horizontal, uh, vertical line here to show where we are. Sandman is here. We lose a little bit for not knowing the channel or actually learning it, but we don't use any extra time slots to estimate the channel, so we don't lose any rate. But if you want to now use a method that has a dedicated phase to estimate um, the jammer, you can see here to get very close to the performance of Sandman and the geniated version, you need to spend a huge amount of time slots to actually accurately estimate the jammer, jammer in this case. And if you don't allocate that many time slots, yes, you get a higher rate, but you also lose a huge amount of performance. So this also shows that uh, this joint uh, mitigation and estimation paradigm is extremely efficient also in terms of achievable rate because you're not wasting any additional resources to try to identify the jammer. And on top of that, of course, the jammer could just evade your estimation method and just not transmit when you're trying to uh, estimate. Okay, so these are basically uh, the topics I wanted to talk today. I want to quickly summarize uh, what I've been saying. We all know that uh, communication infrastructure is more and more critical. It could be water supply, it could be traffic, it could be electricity. Um, and of course, if there are jamming attacks, uh, they must be somehow mitigated. And we've looked at basically two methods uh, that deal with jammers before the ADCs. Uh, SNPs is this non-adaptive analog transform. You fix a circuit that does an analog spatial transform, and then you deal with the jammer later. And the goal here is that not all ADCs will be contaminated fully, but only a subset of the ADCs. Hermit is the adaptive version of projection uh, or POS, where we considered finite alphabet uh, constraints on the multiplications we can do in the analog domain. And uh, basically, again, you can do this before the ADCs. This is similar to then a hybrid architecture where you do something in the analog domain and doing something in the digital domain. Then we've also shown that if the jammers are not silly or naive, um, they can totally evade your channel estimation or jammer estimation um, phase. So this doesn't work, but this paradigm that we propose, which is jammer, joint jammer estimation and data detection or JMD can uh, basically address this. Uh, we've shown two ways, uh, Sandman and MAD, which uh, are very uh, effective in mitigating smart or reactive jammers. Sandman is the technique where we just do a linear channel estimate and we plug it in into our optimization problem. And MAD is the full-blown technique that uh, estimates the channel, detects the data symbols, and also mitigates the jammer at once. Uh, so of course, a little bit more complex, but this is the ultimate way, and this is a more effective uh, computationally less expensive way. If uh, these results spark your interest, of course, we'll be happy uh, to visit our website of the in integrated information processing group. So we can go there with all the papers there. And basically, um, uh, what I would like to say that this is uh, almost it. Uh, stay tuned. We have quite a few more papers in the pipeline about this. There are significant improvements on some of the things. We also looked at hardware aspects. And uh, here are the main papers that we're covered right now. And uh, just I wanted to mention again, uh, this is most work, uh, mostly work of my PhD students, uh, John Marty and Oscar Castaneda. Uh, we're still working on this. And as I said, uh, you don't have to wait that long to see some more new results um, on this topic. And with this, I would like to conclude. And now I'm uh, very happy to take questions. <laughs>